Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Okay, there is a spatial problem right here <laughs> that I quite often encounter. <laughs> maybe, you know, just spontaneous idea, you know, for future. Maybe there can be a stool <laughs> for people like me. <laughs> maybe I carry my own stool with me from now on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out all the way to Afna. Um, to this beautiful place and bringing all the sunshine with you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing over the last um, almost 10 years now. Oh, thank you. On um, global cyberfeminism in the context of our research project that was already uh, mentioned um, at a house at York University, funded by the Canadian government. I have to apologize that I speak in English to you. Yes, my native tongue is German, but uh, my professional language has not increased, uh, so I felt like I can't talk to you in childish German, or, or normal German, not academic German, let's put it that way. Uh, so, but I will, of course, then we can switch into German. Uh, I don't know if... I didn't dare to, to ask you that, but... Feel free to do as you like. There are actually a few guests that only speak in English, so we can continue in English if you prefer. Pardon? There are actually some guests here today that only okay. speak English, Perfect. so we could okay. speak in English. Yeah, okay, good. Yes, I will, I mean, I will for sure have my paper in English. Mm -hmm. No question asked. <laughs> But, you know, then afterwards uh, for the discussion. But I'm happy to continue in English also the discussion. So you can ask uh, questions in German and I will answer back in English. So, let me start. We who write about cities are experiencing a failure of nerve. Never have so many of us written about suburbanization, suburbanism, and suburbs, but never have we expressed so much uneasiness about the world itself, uh, about the word and the world, <laughs> probably also itself, and about the urban reality to which it is supposed to refer. Urban areas of any size are demonstrably dispersed and polycentric, their outer districts diverse, so diverse that they defy generalization. This is apparent around the globe. Uh, there's a range of urban forms, incomes and lifestyles that are increasing. The range of urban forms, incomes and lifestyles are increasing. What can all of these places possibly share? Increasingly, if only implicitly, the common answer seems to be not much. And yet, following uh, what Jenny Robinson says, we can say that uh, we enter a new phase of comparative urban research, where both experimental thinking and foundational rigor are coming together. And I think that the ERS is such a place where interdisciplinary is cherished and where experimental thinking and foundational rigor is taking place. In the book, oops, oh. So, uh, sorry, I should have held up the book. I will, I will pass it around so you can take a peek in it. Um, I think there's also a second copy on the other side. Are we well prepared <laughs> without knowing <laughs> we both for the copy. So what we can say that uh, in, in our book, uh, my co-editor co Richard Harris and I we look at suburban land as a distinctive issue worldwide and argue that the unique quality of land is that it is transitional. It is transitional along three dimensions, geographical, historical, 
and cultural. The most significant is the cultural. If this is understood in its broad anthropological sense, for this defines the values associated with land, suburban or otherwise. In Western societies and increasingly elsewhere, those values are understood in terms of a binary, used and exchange value, where the latter is determined through a more or less regulated market. The immediate quality of suburban space is obvious to anyone who has driven, ridden, or flown into a major metropolitan area. It lies between city and the country, the urban and the rural. There is, in fact, a broad urban periphery. It extends from urban peripheral areas that are fully developed into an outer exurban or peri-urban fringe where urban and rural land uses intermingle. Beyond it is a territory we can call the countryside, even though in places <coughs> like Vancouver or Cairo, it may be mountains or deserts. Suburban areas then are places in between, or as Tom Sieverts called it, the Zwischenstadt. Mm -hmm. One of those consequences is that population and building densities, which are usually measured by the ratio between numbers of floors and build up land, tend to decline away from the urban center. Suburban territory contains a lot of visible infrastructure. This can include self storage facilities electricity transition towers and pipelines, but pertain overwhelmingly to transportation of people and goods. Highways, parking lots, rail lines, freight yards, truck terminals, warehouses, storage tanks, and airports. Much of this serves the city and links it to the region and places beyond. It is precisely what visitors, commuters, and truckers need in order to get to and from the center. Other infrastructures serve the whole metropolitan area, but are simply too land extensive to be fitted into the city. This is increasingly at odds with the stereotype of the suburbs as being quintessentially residential in character. Suburban areas are also transitional spaces in historical terms. The city and the country may change, but in most cases, their overall layout has been that way for many decades, perhaps centuries, if not even millennia. In contrast, a suburban area is a temporary thing. It is most obviously true of the outer peri-urban territory. Even a casual visitor can sense that a landscape that just juxtaposes piggeries, junkyards, cornfields, motels, and scattered houses which surround cities from Canada to France to China cannot resist the growth pressure of capitalism indefinitely. On a longer timeline, the same is true of the sparkling, spanking new subdivision. Numerous words have been expanded in trying, in trying to characterize the urban way of life and in critiquing the idea that there is such a thing. Some writers have associated suburbanism with familialism as the habitus of families with children who seek greater privacy and outdoor play spaces, whether public or private, together with a safe removal from the adult <coughs> expectations and perceived risks of the city. A perspective that has heavily put forward that was heavily put forward 
by the sales strategies employed by developers of the suburbs. In those places, many others and many others besides, suburban living normally mandates the use of privatized modes of transportation. Public transit is less viable, meaning that it is less frequent, less convenient, or simply absent. This reflects not only the simple economic arithmetic of lower residential densities of most places, but also the complex geometry of metropolitan living, as well as the political will for infrastructure investment. Life in a rural setting imposes particular, above all, seasonal rhythms on life. Of course, these can vary. It commonly involves the busyness of planting and of harvesting. In contrast to urban living, um, in contrast, <coughs> urban living is ruled by the clock. The nine to five, the plant meeting, the transit schedule, or by the challenges of juggling two or more precarious part-time jobs in different locations. This goes with a way of life in which measurements of all sorts becomes precise. Of money above all, but also of living space. Most suburban nights lie unambiguously on the urban side of this divide. Many people choose suburban living not for any supposed quasi-rural lifestyle, but simply because suburban homes are cheaper if paid for in part by longer commutes and the cost that involves. And then there are those who have been unwittingly or uh, and often unwillingly drawn into the city's ambit. These include farmers, of course, and also those who serve them, truck and equipment dealers, seed merchants, and the whole range of businesses that are needed to support any community of people, from restaurants to places of worship. The tensions between these long-standing rural interests and the incomers can be as broad as those between both groups and the agents of the expanding city. If there is a suburban marriage here, it is a neutral force by fate, or if you prefer, by larger and in, um, insecure forces, not one entered into voluntary on the basis of shared values. When we talk about the value that is attached to, to land, you can see that it is above all the dynamic juxtaposition of values that most clearly are set in the suburban, that sets the suburban environments apart, and which eventually shapes the nature of the geographical and historical transition. Many of these values pertain to the meaning of land, but before we consider these, we need to pause and contemplate what is meant by value. We routinely distinguish between two types of value, exchange and use value, recognizing that there is a relation between the two. Rural land differs in kind from urban in that both types of value uh, de uh, of value depend on its intrinsic quality, such as fertility and capacity for raw material. For businesses, it is a question of how profitable a location is, and therefore what site rent it can afford to pay. For residents, affordability involves above all a trade-off between the costs of transportation and housing, where variations in the latter are determined by the price of land. In general, 
The more accessible the size, the more valuable. While historically suburban land development can be linked to property <coughs> ownership, industrialization, and displacement, the current pe period is driven by post 40s regional economies, globalization, and neoliberalization. Ever since economic restructuring and globalization produced new forms of urban areas, the underlying logic of land value is no longer as simple as it was in the early, in the 19th and the 20th century, if it ever was. Urban areas have become polycentric, polynuclear, and are vast assemblages of human settlements, to refer to John Friedman's work, bound together through complex, distant, and less widely understood networks, referring to Matthew Gandhi's work. This new reality questions our conceptual thinking about what constitutes the urban and with it the value that is attached to it. Already in 1970s, um, or in the 1970, Henri Lefebvre declared that most of the earth was urbanized and hence he called it this process planetary urbanization. Based on Lefebvre's <coughs> argument, current literature is proposing not to understand the urban and suburban as bounded entities, but instead to see them being exposed to and integrated into the same process of extended <coughs> urbanization. Nevertheless, it is plausible and justifiable to look at suburban land production empirically and conceptually. From the planetary literature, we know that land production and the question of land must be seen within a worldwide context as described by Henri Lefebvre as implosion and explosion, and that suburbanization is embedded in processes of extended urbanization. It is about taking possession of land with a relationship between primitive accumulation and urban commons. Land taking, original accumulation, and accumulation by dispossession are front and center in the suburban land question, just like financialization. This way of theorizing about the urban has been central to Christian Schmidt's own work, and more recently in his collaboration, uh, collaboration with Neil Brenner, where they invite us to rethink the processes of urbanization. To quote, this emergent planetary formation of urbanization is deeply uneven and variegated, and emergent patterns and pathways of socio-spatial differentiation within and across this worldwide urban fabric surely require sustained investigation at various geographical scales." End of quote. Similar ways of thinking have been expressed by Roberto Montemor, who has stated in the context of the Brazilian Amazon that, quote, urban industrial processes impose themselves over virtually all social space. End of quote. These can be faraway places such as the mining industries in the Chilean, Chilean Andes, the sorts of new development dubbed edge cities by uh, Joel Caro, or older settlements that have been en encompassed by the growth of a larger and more dynamic place. In my earlier work, um, I called it flex space. Highlighting, oh no, I call it flex space, highlighting the relationship between economic and structural changes within a system of flexible accumulation and its spa spatial articulation. Almost every major urban area provides one or more illustrations of the complexity of these new urban configurations. This is especially true in Southeast Asia, where the high density of rural settlements has meant that innumerable villages 
have been incorporated more or less effectively into expanding metropolitan areas. But geographically and historically, changes in price and density gradients are not smooth. This matters because the value of land under urban use is always greater, usually much greater than any other type of rural acti activity. The difference is commonly an order of magnitude. Land is a commodity whose price is determined by its utility and that it will be used in a way that is most useful or profitable. But that is not the way that land has always been valued. Beneath is an act of, um, uh, beneath this process were acts of appropriation. In North America, native people had a very different understanding of land from that of European colonizers. Even in Britain, the source of much thinking and law regarding the land market, the meaning of land as commodity varied and has evolved with shifting forms of tenure. <laughs> Today in Anglo America, we see more than 50 forms of tenures. <clears throat> Each comes with a distinctive bundle of rights. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Should have taken that sip much earlier, I think. <laughs> and the uh, story, <coughs> the logic of private property is not the whole story. Even today, non-indigenous <coughs> owners often treat urban land as more than just real estate. <clears throat> Oops. <coughs> more than just real estate, <clears throat> an instrumental commodity to be devoted to its highest and best, that is most profitable use. The behavior <clears throat> of owners of land depends on their attitude, attachments, expectations, and goals. <coughs> Certain attachments to land override other considerations. Nowhere, uh, nowhere is all urban land a commodity or expected to be. Some societies attack unique and values to particular sites whose ownership and use may not be changed. Others treat ownership as communal so that decisions about use and possible sale, even when allowed, become complex. Almost all forms of land tenure make provisions for both for individual and communal rights. But the balance varies. Some extend that communal element to past and future generations, making the very idea of changing land use moot. <clears throat> there is this mythical statement of an African chief uh, who says that in his culture, quote, land belongs to a vast family of which many are dead, few are living, and countless numbers are still unborn. In the Canadian context, this is called the <coughs> care of the land, meaning to only take as much as you need and to attain to the land so that future generations will find the same richness in the earth. Of course, this is based on a, a different interpretation of land, what land constitutes. And this is one of the main topics in Canada of today between land rights, who has right to the land, unresolved questions since colonialism. 
and I think I will talk about this. I can't. I will come back to that a little bit more in the in the PhD seminar that I'm uh, going to have on Wednesday. So, because I think it is an absolutely central, fundamental question in today's world, where we live with difference, <coughs> diversity, um, and so on. And I, I personally think that um, we have to revisit how we look at land from that particular perspective. So when we look at property rights around the world, we often can find a, coexist a coexistence of two or more forms of land tenure. This is a type of legal pluralism. Alain Durand Lasserf uh, calls it the local land delivery system. Um, were uh, on a book that were his colleague and him discerned three different elements. The private for formal mechanisms that we often refer to as the market, the public or parapublic, and the customary. Therefore, the distinction between public and private, which seems intuitively obvious to most North Americans, is blurred or even meaningless. So we have three different perspectives here. That uh, first with the African chief, then with the Canadian uh, um, um, indigenous population, and now with um, Mali's population of uh, bringing also the customary aspect. So the suburban land market is a particular kind of market because land is never traded. You can't move land. Only the right to use it is tradable. Therefore, land markets are notoriously local. One of the most important consequences of land's immobility is that every site is unavoidable associated with externalities. The immobility of land and the ubiquity of localized externalities does much uh, to define the nature of the land market. Urban densities compel regulation of noise, pollution, traffic, views, and by extension, land use. Therefore, we can say that regulation is as much a uniquely urban phenomena as density is. Construction by amateurs, for example, is often viewed as unacceptable or even necessary in rural um, context, but may be effectively prohibited in the city because of perceived fire or health hazards. Buildings in, building standards in cities are higher. If informality is understood as the evasion of government status, bylaws or taxes then um, I'm sorry. If informality is understood as the evasion of government's status, statuses, bylaws, or taxes, then it too may be thought of as, a, as peculiarly urban. You think this helps? That's right. This is what you had to move on. Thank you. Mm. Much better. Much better. Rainbow! Sorry, this was the meme. Switzerland. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by them. <laughs> <laughs> Governments also come under pressure to provide more public infrastructure. Water and sewer pipes, transportation infrastructure, parks and open areas. Cities then require more and a wider range of public infrastructure, even to the extent of removing some sites from the market entirely. Unambiguous, um, unambiguous uh, title to land is also important because urban land is so much more expensive than rural. 
financing is usually critical for home buyers and developers alike and mortgage lenders like their investment to be secured. Indeed, the large lenders prefer whole development packages to be standardized because the risks are more predictable. Cities are places where the land first becomes commodified. But of course, historically and geographically, there must be a transition from rural land, unregulated and perhaps not even viewed as a commodity into the urban market. The places in between city and country, the suburban areas and the peri-urban fringes that lies just beyond our that transition happens. So how does the suburban market uh, differ from the urban market? The urban fringe presents some unique and significant features. The most striking and general of these arises from the jump in value that occurs when rural land at the periphery is converted to urban use. In proportional terms, this is a far greater increase than with any other type of land use change. Large profits are to be made by those who are able to buy cheap and sell dear. This, have, this can have a myriad of effects depending on the context. It gives landowners a strong incentive to develop their properties where conversion is regulated. It encourages them to lobby or bribe local politicians to change the zoning. It attracts outside investors whose deep pockets can up the ante. And it encourages local governments themselves to claim some of the increase, whether through ad hoc bribery, by claiming all or part of the development gain through the imposition of development charges and taxes on land transfer, or through the appropriation of land and then by acting as developers in their own right. Another distinctive <coughs> element to the suburban land market concerns the manner by which the public infrastructure is provided before or after. And here we kind of we can enter a discussion on where it is geographically located and what we see quite often in the so-called global north in infrastructure happens before in the so-called global south infrastructure follows development. Another suburban feature in areas around the globe is the juxtaposition of private with customary forms of ownership. In significant ways then the character of suburban land is different from that of its urban or rural counterparts. It's doubly transitional. It juxtaposes and combines very different tenure forms to an exceptional degree. And straddling the zone that encompasses a fundamental change in land use, it offers the prospect of unusual speculative profits. So we can summarize here that suburbs are transitional in space, in time, and also in their cultural aspects. And the four key aspects of current condition of suburban land markets are urbanization, globalization of capital and culture, the steady commodification of land, and currently a boom in land prices. All this together has led to the fact that urban forms have become more similar, if not even the same, around the globe. And this observation also seems to be true in the suburban region. And I'm going to uh, have a quick, uh, relatively quick, going through some slides. But before we do that, to, to show you, you know, what I've just, what I've just said. But before we go there, I think that these are the central questions that we always have to um, 
asked when we allotted land. Who owns land? Who controls land? We had not, we had not compared notes. No, I so, just thought what you are going to put in. So. And then, and then, and then when you introduced me, you know, then I wrote down, yeah, who owns, controls land? That's exactly yeah. the same thing. So these are the two fundamental questions mm -hmm. from my perspective. And from, from those two fundamental questions, then, you know, kind of sub-questions follow. Uh, profit for whom, pressures for public agencies, when, where development will happen, forms of development, what kind of forms of development are taking place. So let me um, take you on a little bit of a journey around the world. So using a visual analysis of what is happening. Uh, on the one hand, we have the view from you know, from below, the ethnographic perspective. On the other hand, we have the view from above. Kind of, you know, the perspective that we were arguing against and that came with modernism and we can ele elevate ourselves and have this rational, comprehensive perspective by, you know, I'm thinking in particular Le Corbusier who uh, you know, said to view from above, les yeux qui ne voient pas, mm -hmm. right? Eyes that don't see because we can't elevate and so from the airplane we then see the world better. So I'm taking you on a journey around the world from the airplane. Uh, bear in mind, of course, I'm not arguing that this is the only way, but it is a helpful way to, to do it. Uh, we actually do touch ground at one point. Um, <laughs> no crash landing though. <laughs> so um, yes, let me go on my journey here and then um, just quickly, where is that? Any country, any city, any Canada. continent. Canada. What? Canada, no. Japan. No. Germany. No. Switzerland. No? <laughs> it's Mexico. Mexico City. <clears throat> Where's that? Canada. States of Canada. States of Canada. Uh, very good. Yes, Canada. It's Calgary. But I'm trying to... So these are always in here, right, with each other, the next two slides. And I'm going to show. So what the argument here is that the constant different shapes and forms, you know, the rectangular extension of the city into the green belt, or the North American, you know, uh, rounded version with cul-de-sacs and everything else that uh, doesn't really make cities, um, but we have it here. So, where is this? China. Wow! <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> that was way too fast. <laughs> yes, it's uh, before Beijing. What is this? Paris. What? Paris. Wow! You guys are so good! <laughs> you know, yes, it's... Can you see it from the... <laughs> so this is Paris. Again, you know, <laughs> the yard plan here is the first one was low rise. I have a single family home. This uh, is all high rise living in the suburbs on the edge of the city in very kind of rigid form, straight form, and then kind of, you know, taking out what we saw with uh, Calgary more than Gandhi. I mean, the French version of Gandhi, you know, so it's still very too, too metric. Round the version. Okay, so where is that? <laughs> Germany is not bad. It's not Germany. It's not Austria, yes. Somebody said Austria. Uh, close to Vienna, Austria. Uh, where is this? Baltic hmm? States somewhere. Others? <laughs> Could be anywhere, right? So it is, uh, again, it's China. What I'm showing here is really what I call flex space. So it both comes 
um, in, in, you know, it's very similar. You would not know where that is, not know where, the, well, obviously you guys know it, but <laughs> you have the exception. <laughs> um, what is interesting here, maybe I'll just go back to the bigger picture here, is this juxtaposition of different usages um, cut through, of course, with the infrastructure. <laughs> So you see the industrial zones next to single-family homes, uh, next to uh, mid-rise apartment buildings and agriculture. So it's this pattern patchwork with usages that are not really um, comparable with each other. Uh, the same as in the Chinese uh, landscape. We also could go into the details. Where's this? Africa? Africa. <laughs> Others? Come on, say something. Just say something. Anything. Athens. Athens? Belgium. Hmm? Belgium, maybe. Belgium? Mm. We're thinking Russia. <laughs> what about it? Russia? Russia? Okay, this was taken yesterday on my way in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I wanted to hear all, all other places. I was hoping that nobody would say Berlin. <laughs> so you have it in your backyard here. Um, where is this? <laughs> Prague? No, no, not Prague. Other suggestions? Brazil. What? Brazil. No. No. <laughs> but it's it's actually closer than the previous. So this is Sao Paulo. Uh, well, Brazil. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It is Brazil. Because I have to do it. I'm cheating. So, again, same thing. So these are the industrial complex outside of the cities that I, you know, what I said earlier. Sorry are uh, part of the infrastructure of urban regions, I guess, as production zones, as distribution centers, as any kind of industrial usages. Uh, what is also interesting in this whole thing is, of course, that they are single, maybe two-story high, the most, using up a lot of land. And why has never ever anybody thought about maybe, you know, this distribution centers to stack them up on top of each other so actually they would not use as much land as they do, which leads to the ecological question, of course, of all that, which I have not touched. So we are here on the ground. Where is that? Well, clearly. Uh, probably nobody can read the signs, but we know where it is. Um, so it's in Shanghai. And this one here, Greece. Greece. Wow, you are so good. <laughs> That's really amazing. Two techniques. No, one technique, a construction technique, which is using concrete. So this is my point here. One is very formalized with a lot of capital inflow pushed into one particular part of the city, filled up with in no time, versus here is gradually building up when money comes available and eventually a house, a full house will be there. Uh, same technique, building technique. Um, whereas where can we find places like this? At the outskirts of uh, Mexico City compared to Accra, yeah, that's the right continent. Uh, it's uh, Johannesburg, Montevideo, and so what we can see here is informal settlements that are outside of the cities. Um, 
build, uh, using building materials that are um, also incremental, um, then we take the view up again. Um, okay, this is a fun part to compare. Where is this? This is a really fun part, exercise now that is coming up. Germany, no? It's Europe. It's not France. It's in the south of Europe. Greece, yeah, so it's Athens. Um, then, ooh, shoot. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ooh, I tricked myself. No, it is actually, sorry. This one here is, <laughs> I didn't look closely. So this is Greece, this is Athens. Where is this? What? Japan. Japan, very good. Who was that? Me, but I read a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we, when we put both together, what do we see? We see one urban fabric as if they are next to each other, as if they are part of the same city. Right? Similar structure, Incremental build, no master plan, individuals building their homes over time. The urban fabric kind of organically evolves, has some certain lines, but then also a lot of irregularities. Of course, the fun part here is why it looks so similar is because the roofs in Japan quite often use blue, mm -hmm. and uh, the swimming pools are uh, in Greece. Was also blue, and that's where then uh, the, the imagery tricks you a little bit into thinking it's the same city. <laughs> okay, the last, the final pair that I have here. Friends. Hmm? Friends. Friends, no? Zero. Mm -hmm. No, it's not Germany. Scandinavia. Yeah, Scandinavia. It's a uh, so Helsinki. Scouts mm -hmm. skirts of Helsinki. And where is this? Austria, no? Not UK. Mexico. Mexico. Who was Mexico? Also with the help of the book? <laughs> 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 so it's the outskirts of Mexico. So you have these two pairs that are geographically completely on different uh, um, sides, but also politically very different, right? But then we see the same thing, which maybe the projection here is not as, as good as you know the, to see it. But you see a clear edge of the city, and kind of making this border to the city. The line here, the clear, this is the city, this is the countryside. But then you also see these streets that are eating into, eventually, in the forest, talking about further development uh, beyond the current city line or physical line. So, while I'm not suggesting that we should generalize from any of those cases, it is the careful engagement with the photographic material of spatial forms that speaks to the heart of the field to, um, for international comparative research, to make another reference to Jenny Robinson's work. Apart from their intrinsic appeal, images of the, of the urban landscape can tell us a great deal about development processes at the urban fringe and how to understand them within the context of an ever-expanding market economy at the beginning of the 21st century. They show us the variety of ways in which, as Henri Lefebvre once argued, the whole world is being urbanized. Suburban lands development is therefore front and center of processes of urbanization. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Just, yeah. And, uh,
Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, my name is Laura Cabet from also the um, art department here at the Language Institute for um, um, Research and Society in Space. And my task today is just to moderate the discussion. In the first place, I call you um, uh, Professor Russell to the stage and put it up. 